episode 148. Are these comics going to make good film and television shows? We have the Sacrificers and we have the Rocketeer Breaks Free. Let's check them out right now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for spending time with me as we rant about movies, comic books, and television shows, as well as the occasional board game. I am your host, Frank Zanka. I'm an award-winning screenwriter, novelist, and comic book writer, as well as a filmmaker. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a couple of comics today, only two today. Uh, this will finish up my week, even though I did buy, uh, it was, today was Dragon Con, uh, so I did buy a couple of uh, Fantastic Four books back from the 80s. We'll talk about those later. Uh, but yeah, so also I am a game designer, and I know I plug this every time, but we're going to be launching in October with Mark Spears' artwork on our classic Monsters Myth Lords card game. You can find the link below to Kickstarter where you can sign up and be notified for when we launch in October for Halloween. We're going to be launching about October 1st. Anyway, check that out. We have about 400 people right now signed up and uh, to get notified and you could be that next person so go ahead and link check that link and it's very easy you just type your information and boom and it will notify you about when we're going or if you have a kickstarter account that you don't have to ask about anything and uh, boom you're done all right so uh let's jump into this give me a like give me a subscribe and uh also remember to to uh ring that bell if you can i'm trying to grow the channel out but before we jump into the actual thing, I want to show you this from Sacrificers. If you're not reading Sacrificers by Rick Remender, and I do this uh, this whole series for a bunch of reasons, not only for people that are collecting comics and see what else is out there, for people that aren't collecting comics so that they can see what may or may not hit the screen. Because as you know, a lot of comics are being turned into movies and television shows. So even if you're not a collector, we're going to show you what is out there so when it does hit the uh the screen you can say oh yeah i remember that one also if you want to jump to various other books uh or the next book the we do have a chapter selection below but anyway rick remender does sacrificers and i met one of the artists that does some of the covers or does did one of the uh, covers there of soluna uh and i saw this and i had to buy it um and then she upgraded me so originally it was 20 bucks that I got upgraded to 40 <laughs> because it's on this special paper or whatever else that makes the colors come out the way they should. Uh, but yeah, her name is Tahani Farr and it is signed here because you see there's two signatures. One is the original signature and the other one's a printed signature. But yeah, so amazing stuff. I had to show that. Of course, uh, I, I told her that uh, so Luna doesn't look like this anymore. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, she's emaciated now. But this is what the character originally looked like uh, in the beginning of the story, and now she doesn't anymore. But anyway, let's uh, so let's jump into Sacrificers. This is the story, this is a very heartbreaking story of a family of pigeons. Okay, so they're not humans. And there's these gods of different things. There's the god of harvest, there's the god of the ocean, so it's almost like a Greek or a Roman mythology situation. But these gods have to drink this elixir every few years or they will age. Uh, and they continue to age. And then when they drink this elixir, uh, then it may even be every year. Then, of course, they're rejuvenated. So where does this elixir come from? The sacrifice of children. So each family gives up a child. It's got to be every few years because the one, yeah, it's got to be every few years because one uh, pigeon, his father beat him consistently. They left him in a barn because they didn't want him mingling with the other kids. They didn't want the, uh, the sacrifice to be, they don't think they even named him, to be uh, anything that they would get attached to because they knew he was going to leave. And when he does get picked up, the one sister was the only one that was nice to him. And he goes off to be sacrificed. 
And what happens is they, it's almost like a Willy Wonka situation where they make everybody feel amazing. All the kids are, think they're happy. They're like, oh, this is amazing. And then they put them in this chair and they put spikes in their head and they draw out whatever liquids in their brain or whatever. And they want them to be happy because the happy juice is what, uh, is what rejuvenates the gods as opposed to the fear one, which is useless to them. So anyway, the one pigeon ends up escaping and ends up in a big fight and he ends up uh, with the powers of the daughter, Saluna, of what you just saw the picture of. So she's all practically dead and emaciated now as if she's, you know, 10 years, uh, 10 years older than the oldest guy out there, which is her dad. She is the daughter of the sun and the moon, Saluna, get it? So anyway, she has now been like cast out. She's on the run. She's trying to go like into man's world. She has these tendrils that are coming out of her mouth and eyes and killing people. I don't I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what that means. We haven't been told yet. Meanwhile, Pigeon's kicking ass. He's going up to all the gods and killing them. And he the first one that he ended up killing was the god of the sea who created a tidal wave or whatever else and ended up wiping out his brothers and sisters, which he didn't realize. So the little girl pigeon and the father and the mother are the only ones left, and they run into Saluna and take her in. And that's where we're at right now. So a lot of stuff has happened up till now, and this is issue number 11. So we have this very odd opening of all of, uh, uh, of this body that is coming out, and they give it to the king... This was uh, his queen that was having the affair with the god of the god of the sea. So he's she's brought back to her husband, and he's like, "How did this happen? Why was she there? Blah blah blah." And they're questioning one of the king's uh, emissaries or whatever, one of his cabinet, and he's like, "I can't really tell you much. <laughs> I can't tell you because <laughs> you're not gonna like it." But he ends up telling him that, uh, that, that they were having an affair. And he is none too happy. So then we switch back to the guy who actually creates the elixir, who is a pigeon also. But he has this, always has this helmet on, so we didn't know this till later. But anyway, he's, uh, he's working and toiling and things to that effect. And he gets a call from Soluna's dad, who is the king. He is the god of the sun. And he's like, where's my daughter? Blah, blah, blah. You got to find her. And ever somebody has to know. So you go take another sacrifice from all the families. He's like, is that a good idea? That is my decree. You go do it. He's like, okay, I'm going to go do it. And he's like, uh, how can I gonna turn this to my advantage? And his girlfriend comes in and says, you're not really going to do it, are you? He's like, yeah, I am, because I got to find Saluna, and I got to kill her, because I can't have her telling everyone what she saw me do, and he was, you know, he was all messing around because he felt slighted. So, uh, that's how that whole fight occurred, was that he was betraying everyone. So now we switch over to the pigeons, who have now taken in Saluna, and you can see that she looks like she's 90, even though she's a teenager. And, you know, we're feeling, uh, oh, there's a statue of her mother there, which is the moon. And she's finally eating because she hasn't been able to eat anything. And uh, because nobody's believed that she was the princess. <laughs> and they're grieving because their whole family now is dead except for the one girl. And she's like, I lost my, my brother. This is kind of heartbreaking. I lost all my brothers and sisters. They were all drowned. And she's like... Can you be my new sister? I thought that was pretty heartbreaking. So she's like, yes, I can do that. But then she goes to sleep. And this is why I'm, I'm still weirded out about this because I don't know what's happening. But that goop is coming out of her eyes and her mouth. Going, oh, probably, maybe it's, it's her nose too. She got like snot going on. Don't touch my snot! And it's going after the girl. I'm like, oh, no, don't kill the girl. But she, but it doesn't. Because at the last second, the uh, 
beasties break in and they go we want another sacrifice and they're like no no she's the only one we have left and so luna actually growing up uh because she was kind of uh kind of a bitchy uh towards everything she has something to prove uh says no no take me take me and the, the other guy's like i'm blind oh that's right. She says, take me instead of the kid because the other guy's blind and without the kid, he's, he's, he's just going to die. So he says, take me instead of the kid. So she sacrifices herself and this is what the other pigeon looks like with the helmet on, um, on this side here. So he, this is where I call bullshit though. So he's now looking for Soluna, right? Uh, so they're tied up and he doesn't, recognizing the, the moon on her face is pretty much a giveaway and he knows that she, she's emaciated because he saw her run away i don't know but he's like the, the father's like no you can't take her and you know because the wife is like do something and he actually gets a good belt in there but it's not good enough he just gets belted back and that's about the extent of that and the kids get taken away and the parents are now alone and so Luna's like, don't worry, don't worry. So really good stuff. Again, kind of heartbreaking what's going on, uh, even though they're animals for the most part or gods and, you know, nothing that resembles us, <laughs> you know. So everybody that wants to see themselves in this comic ain't going to happen. <laughs> There's no resemblance to any of us <laughs> in there. So uh, pretty good stuff. So the only way they can really make this into a movie is if they uh, made an animated. I don't. I don't see this happening as a live action, unless they, you know, changed everything to human. That would be, and I think that would take away something from it. So, but animated would work. All right. So let's jump into the Rocketeer breaks free. Free breaks free. Free. <laughs> so this is a story of Cliff Secord. Disney did a Rocketeer movie back in the 90s, uh, which was, I thought, very fun uh, with Jennifer Conley. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that she was supposed to be playing Betty Page. But, of course, they changed it. They didn't have the rights to Betty Page at the time. And then uh, the guy who played Bond uh, is also, he played the villain. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. It was lots of fun. The music was really great. And it's basically a guy that, you know, gets a jetpack and becomes a superhero. That's pretty much it. Uh, so in this particular episode, they uh, or in this run, they are going to San Francisco. She's, he's not supposed to be taking the pack. I think she's supposed to be doing something. She's an actress, so she's supposed to be doing something on set. And meanwhile, PV, who is the mechanic, and obviously their good friend, even though he's older, uh... He and the person that they're staying with, her mother, uh, them kind of getting on a little bit. Uh, so, and I think that the, the woman they're staying with is a cop or something to that effect. So anyway, at the, there was every time that he's uh, supposed to be not doing any rocketeer work, he, uh, <laughs> he has it in the trunk and didn't tell her. So there was a trolley mishap and of course he gets the the jetpack and saves people, even though there was no way he put that on fast enough <laughs> and the helmet to save all those people, but he did. So I thought this one was a pretty cinematic. They're reporting on him and, and they also have his uh, balloon in the Thanksgiving Day parade and didn't pay him anything because he's got a secret identity, but he's still pissed off about it. Uh, the faces are only okay in this one. I don't like them as much, but yeah, so they're going to go to see the bridge, the San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, and they're they're wanting PV and the mom to be basically alone. Uh, Betty and Cliff decide to go and do their own thing, so there's only the three of them. And he's like, you're going to miss out, buddy. The bridge is the most amazing thing ever. And he's like, nah, nah, you go ahead. So they're in the car, and of course, they the daughter's trying to get them to talk more and, and they finally get to the bridge and she's like you're right the bridge is amazing and he's like she's like go t tell her something and uh <laughs> so of course he's not 
the most uh, eloquent person in the world. He says, yeah, Mr. If you say Mr. It makes me, you know, sound old. And she says, well, you sure don't look old, Peavy. Not where from where I'm standing. And he says, you don't look that no old neither. <laughs> She's like, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. And meanwhile, the daughter's like face palming. <laughs> But meanwhile, uh, Betty and Cliff are having a picnic and he's, you know, complimenting her about her acting and all this other stuff. But then, I don't think that the bay is deep enough for a U-boat, but there's a U-boat there. And there's an explosion. They throw missiles at the bridge. So that's a German U-boat with the Nazis, by the way, because it is World War II. And she's like, go, 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 even though he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she's like, no, you don't got to say you're sorry. And this is where it gets very, I, I was really in this when I was reading it. It gets very, very cinematic. I mean, look at that. The, the bridge is blowing up. They have, uh, he's, he's jetting over. The Nazis are jetting, which was the, the last run. The Nazis have their own jetpacks. At least here we could see that there's a U-boat there. Uh, it does get a little bit like, huh? later on but i'll point that out a bullet hits him in the in the helmet which i thought was interesting and he's like oh man you guys again didn't i get rid of you guys in the last one <laughs> but he ends up since he has more experience with the thing he's just running around and they're chasing him and he gets close enough to the water to have one you know get sunk by the waves and then he gets to the U-boat, and here's where I call bullshit. So he gets close enough to the gun, right? You see the gun right there in the second panel. I thought he was going to drop down and then shoot them. But he pulls up just in time, and they hit the side of the hull to the point where the U-boat sinks? No. Five people hitting a U-boat is not going to sink it, no matter how many explosions hit it. It's not going to puncture that hole. So meanwhile, PV's trying to rescue the mom. And he does. And he's like, oh, I'm so glad you were there, Mr. PV. You're amazing. So meanwhile, the daughter doesn't know where they're at. She hooks up with Betty. And Betty's like, I, I don't She She's blaming herself. She's like, I don't know what's going on. Blah, blah, blah. Where's my mom? She's like, don't worry. PV's there. And we get a Superman type of thing here where the car is falling off with uh, the bridge with a daughter and a dad in it. And she said, he's like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. So he's lying to her, of course. And we literally get a scene from Superman, the movie, where he pulls up the car as it's about to fall. He doesn't have super strength, so I would assume that would really hurt his shoulder and stuff like that, trying to get that thing on the ground there. But <laughs> he's not Superman. So she kisses him, even though he's like, yeah, thumbs up, man. I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. And then we get the uh, the U-boat. Uh, I guess another U-boat. Because the other one is sunk. Uh, and they're all in a raft. So let's see what happens here. And that's the cover of, of the next uh, issue. So really, really good stuff. I would love to see another Rocketeer movie. So let's do a recap. Another Rocketeer movie would be amazing. Uh, sacrifices would be great as a cartoon. I don't think you can do it any other way. All right, well, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. Remember to give me that like, give me that thumbs up if you can. And if you can subscribe, please do. And remember, too, that we have Myth Lord Classic Monsters with art by Mark Spears. Woo, you can play as a classic monster. And it's monster vs. monster action. As you recruit other monsters, including the Bride of Frankenstein, Mr. Hyde, the Mummy, and fight over the Mummy's Tomb or the Ghost Ship. Or you're also going to be recruiting them with weapons and things to that effect. It's awesome, and it all is in this one box. And check out that link below. Uh, for the link to Kickstarter to sign up now. All right, check out some of my other videos, and I will see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for watching.